So we have the saying, uh, preaching to the choir, but I don't have a choir to preach to today. I don't even have a congregation to preach to today. And I think probably all over the world, we are seeing empty churches with ministers and pastors delivering their sermons from some place and into a camera. So we are part of that trend. We, I do want to thank uh, our tech crew because this is a wonderful, wonderful thing to live in a community like this because um, just in the little group that helps sustain this, I've got a guitarist from Chile, we've got a camera of women from Germany, we've got a tech person from Croatia, got a translator from Holland, um, one of our tech people from Romania, it's a, uh, and of course we've got some Americans. So it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that we've been experiencing here in this time that we uh, really had to pull together. We uh, are trying to continue to deliver our, um, or to be of service, of course, respecting the norm of social distancing. And um, so it's our pleasure to be with you in this way today. Another thing I imagine all over the world is the subject is really about um, the events in the world today with this virus. And I'm going to get there by and by, but this is a very interesting uh, subject today that deals with that. So I wanted to start with this particular reading from Einstein. And he, uh, he's, he's making a distinction between rational thinking and intuitive awareness. He says, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Einstein further states, I never made one of my discoveries through the process of rational thinking. That's an incredible statement. Just a second, I also want to say, um, if there is back, you don't need these speakers really, right? You can feed it directly into, um, okay? So um, that's an incredible statement to say, I never made one of my discoveries through the process of rational thinking. So I wanted to speak to that today because that's at the heart of our teachings here, especially at Ananda. We practice meditation every day. We practice controlling the mind. We do exercises that we work with trying to direct and control the energies of the nervous system in the body. So one of the surprising things that people don't realize about developing intuition is that it, you can develop it by learning to control the energy of the nervous system. In other words, to reverse the energy of the nervous system, bring it in and bring it up. There's one time only in our 24-hour uh, arc of life that that happens automatically, and that is when we sleep. And when we sleep, the energy withdraws into, from the senses into the spine. It comes up the spine and, and rests in the brain. And that is the one time that there's a natural reversal of this energy in the nervous system. This is important because one of the things that we are discovering in this event of the um, virus and people's anxiety and people's fear is that we need to learn to know how to control our minds and how to control our thoughts. In fact, the nature of fear and anxiety is that we have a, a concern, but that concern rotates and rotates. And we think, for example, what if I got the flu? What, I mean, what if I got the virus? 
It's one thing to say, okay, I'm preparing my body, I'm working at developing and strengthening my immune system, but if we allow our mind to con continue to go, okay, gosh, I mean, what if I, what would I do if I'm in bed with a fever and how will that play out? The more you entertain that in your mind, of course, and rather than of course, in fact, it is, um, it weakens the, the immune system. And it's a well-known fact that worry and stress weaken the immune system. So I wanted to, wor to, um, to actually talk about that a little bit because how, what, we, what many people don't realize, and it's a common truth in yoga, but thoughts are directly related to the energy that comes down the spine and into the nervous system. The only way you can completely calm the mind and stop the spinning mind is to reverse the energy of the nervous system and bring it up. It's the only way. Yoga science teaches if you want to calm the mind, you have to reverse the energy in the nervous system. And so I've met people really who spun and spun and spun. Yogananda said, if you don't learn how to control the spinning mind, it can take you into psychosis. So it's very important for us to learn to control the mind. It doesn't mean that we don't take normal precautions in our lives. It doesn't mean that we, uh, that we, that we follow the proper laws of hygiene. In this case, it doesn't mean that we, we still maintain our social distancing, we still wash our hands, we still do everything that's involved with needing to be careful. But the mind is very important in this whole process. I've been following in this time uh, a very interesting fellow, a Dutch fellow. His name is Wim Hof. And he's a, what we might call a Western yogi. He, um, his wife died of cancer. He really felt something went wrong in the process. Something wasn't right. She shouldn't have died. She should have been able to, to be healed. So he went on a quest. And what he's learned and is learning is very interesting because not only did he go on a quest, but he decided to make that quest or the experiment on his own body. So where I, where I was introduced to the process was that I saw an American journalist who was going to expose him as a fraud. So he went in, this journalist went into the camp and or into the life of Wim Hof because he has a training actually. And Wim Hof does these incredible things. He'll swim under the ice. He'll walk uh, in the winter in the mountains with only his boots and his shorts on, no shirt, no pants. What he does is he goes into a breathing rhythm and he puts his mind steady. So that's what he does when he's under the water. That's what he does uh, in the cold mountain air. He puts his mind steady. So what I saw, which, was, which so much intrigued me, was that scientists had him all wired. He was in a tank, sitting probably cross-legged. I couldn't really see, but all the way up to here. And, it was full of ice water, and they kept put, dumping ice in. There, the, here, there he is sitting to here in ice water. He's doing his breathing. Five minutes, 20 minutes, an hour later, and all the scientists in their white coats measuring his core temperature didn't change. So, I thought, that's intriguing, that's interesting. And he said, you go into your center, you go into your routine. But then, just some months ago, I saw the latest test. Again, he's in the ice water, 
white coats, uh, analysts, scientists. They've got filled with ice water. He, they're measuring his temperature. The surface of his skin did not change. So the inter so now he's being interviewed, and the interview um, takes the uh, goes back to this particular test. So they're watching it together, the interviewer and Wim Hof, and the interviewer says, "Look." I mean, that's impossible. It doesn't even make the news because there's got to be something else going on. And it was tested. His, the surface of his skin, his, his body temperature didn't change. He answered a very interesting answer. He said, the only thing that I can understand is that it's the mind. And that is exactly right. So I'm going to tell a little story on myself because this is leading, this is pertinent to today's subject, even though it may not seem like it. But he recommended that you take cold showers in order to, there's, there's more than one reason, but um, he said that trains the mind, but it also does another thing that's very interesting to the body is that Cold actually produces uh, adrenaline, which helps heat the body. So it's a natural thing if we're outside, and he, of course, claims that part of our health problems in the modern world today is that we're built for a body that's supposed to be in nature and has spent years in nature. And so we have natural, a, a natural response to cold. We have uh, hormones and we have chemicals. We have a mechanism that produces internal heat in the body. So he says if you don't activate that and call on that system, then it lowers your immune system. It's part of what produces a strong immune system. So I did it for two reasons, because I thought, okay, I'll see about my immune system, but I was more intrigued with the mind, because the first time I tried it, the, the shower's on in the morning, and I'm saying, Am I, do I really want to try this? So there's no hot water, there's just cold water. And then I thought, okay, wait. So I turned the hot water on, because it takes a while for the warm water to arrive. So I thought, okay, I can try it this way. I know the warm water is going to come. So. I'll start with cold water, but know that, so I did that, and I about had a heart attack. So the cold water, I can't get my breath, I can't breathe, and I stepped out, I thought, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. Then I thought, no, there's, I should be able, because I practice yoga, I practice meditation, I have worked with trying to concentrate and center my mind for years. The idea is that I should be able to stand under there, focused in my breathing technique, and not lose my center. So, okay, here's the yogi. He goes under. I totally lose my breath. I'm panting. I'm freezing. But the warm water comes, and then I take my shower, and I go on the day. Next day, as it's a stupid thing, and I don't know if I want to do this, but I, wa I wanted to test my mind. Honestly, I know this sounds silly, but after a week, I wanted to do it because I succeeded. I realized I, I water, the cold water under my arms, on my back, over my head, and now I was able to breathe calmly internally, without losing my breath, without my heart, without my body um, reacting. It's all about single-pointed concentration, and that's why he, it made sense when I realized that he was able to climb the mountains or to swim in the icy waters because he did exactly what we do every day. He put his mind on his breath, 
to control the mind. Paramahansa Yogananda said, it's a, a very wonderful tape. It's a, it's a, register, a CD that you can hear his voice, you can hear the discussion, but he says, when a dog hurts his paw, there's a degree of pain, but what the dog lacks that's different than you and me is that we have a sense of ownership. So the dog doesn't say, I hurt my hand, or he has a dim perception of ownership. But when I hurt my hand, I say, I hurt my hand. And Yogananda said that very identification, my hand, actually increases the level of pain. And it increases the pain, level of pain a lot. And it's only a mental identification with it. I've told the story many times here in this community where um, the story of Yogananda when he was, um, when they were building the wishing well at uh, Mount Washington and a group of monks were, were working with Yogananda to roll this big round piece of cement in place and the cement got away from them and it landed on Yogananda's foot and it broke his foot. I mean, his foot was mangled. They were able to lift the cement up and to pull his foot out. It was a bloody, broken fur, foot. Obviously, you understand that. There's pain. He said, let me show you something. And so he said, if I keep my awareness here and don't allow my awareness to travel down with the energy of the nervous system, then I don't feel anything. I can keep it here. And he talked to them the same way I'm talking to you now. But he said, of course, if I allow my awareness to go. And you could see the pain in his face when he allowed his awareness to feel the pain of the body. So I also want to just, just to explain this totally, because I think it's important for us, especially in this time uh, during these events in the world. We live in Italy. And certain Italians, and maybe even more rightfully to say certain Italian women, have this perception that you should not allow a breeze to come across your shoulder or across your neck. So a couple of summers ago, we have a big, uh, we're in a big sala, and I'm sitting toward the back, and the door is, oh, the back, it's a summer hot day, and the Back doors open and there's a side window. And I just happened to look over and I saw a woman beside me and she was agitated. And she would look at the window and she would turn around and look at the door. And so there's, there's this discourse going on and I'm listening to the discourse, but I realize I'm slightly, um, uh, yeah, just a little bit distracted because I see and feel this little bit of energy over here. So I look again and it's still this, this thing about the window and this door. And so, and after a couple minutes, she gets up, she goes back, she closes the door. It's, it's 90 degrees. I mean, we're, the, the, I'm sitting there feeling, ah, oh, the breeze is like just a little kiss on the skin. It's refreshing, it's cooling. She closes the door, she sits down, and she's absolutely at ease. Now she can listen to the discourse. So the sweat begins to build, I'm starting to drip. She's at ease because she now doesn't have this breeze, and she can listen to the discourse. That's how subtle the mind is, is that we let ourselves get caught in these things. And if we don't learn to control our apprehension and don't learn to control our fears, and we here, especially those of us who practice meditation and discip mental discipline, we have an edge because the important thing is, like Yogananda said, we need to control the spinning mind or it will take you to psychosis. And so, yes, okay, the big word in America, not so much here in Italy, is social distancing. 
we've been already practicing uh, or, or adhering to that uh, recommendation here. Let it go, okay? I keep my distance, I let it go. Try not to, you know, so I, I often, if I need to, I'll do something like that rather than my hands that have been on other surfaces, you, then you let it go. But it's important, really important, that we begin to train the mind to not go in to the fears of the day because we're, the mind is what can give you a healthy immune system. When Wim Hof said, I don't understand exactly why my body temperature doesn't change, it must be the mind. Yogananda said, everything is the mind. And that is why you have masters who seemingly produce miracles, but it's the mind because everything around us is coming from pure consciousness. If we want to say spirit, if we want to say cosmic consciousness, they're one and the same thing. It is a consciousness. And like, um, like uh, Amit Goswami said, we can watch the atoms appear from space and then return to space. He said the most stable thing you can say about the atoms is that they are thoughts. And that is, if in fact, what Yogananda said, they are particles of thought. And together, they, from this one consciousness, they form everything, all of the creation that we see around us. So really, we have to think about it in the same way that we exist. I am. That is the, my soul reality. It will never die. It has never been born. Everything that we see around us is flux. It's energy. It comes and goes. It changes. None of us get out of here alive. We all have to leave this body. But this sense of I am never dies. So what, what the masters say is it's obvious. We're in a dream. When we dream, we don't remember where we came from. We don't have any sense of where we're going. We're in that present dream event. Ours is a little different, but we are born. We come through these bodies. This nervous system begins to mature, and we begin to have a nervous system that allows us to self-reflect. We have a nervous system that allows us to say, I am. That nervous system is different than the dog's. The dog has a sense of being, but a much dimmer sense of I am. But in any case, that sense of I am will never die. And so everything around us isn't real. But the mind is where we need to work with if we're ever going to reach that understanding. How many of us really, we have these teachings, how many of us go into the telescopic spiritual eye, just like Jesus said, if thine eye be single, in, in King James, if thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. That's the basis of our teaching. How many of us go into that telescopic spiritual eye and rest in that light? How many of us do that? No, we're concerned with finances. We're concerned with money, our house, the virus, our health, every other thing except that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And where is that? Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. That's the way we overcome the delusion of the mind, is to develop single-pointed concentration. And in that, we can learn the little things first. I mean, I'm not, I'm not recommending that we be radical. It isn't necessary to do the shower test. It isn't necessary to walk in the cold or be in the cold. But it is important and necessary for us to do the practices that help us learn to develop single-pointed concentration 
so that we gain control of the nervous system. The essence of Kriya Yoga is that as we develop our awareness more clearly and more forcefully, uh, the more we can be in the spine and bring our awareness inward, the more we succeed at directing the energy of the nervous system in and up. And what is key to all of this is that Yogananda said, you'll never be able to completely calm the mind as long as there's energy going down the spine. Always the mind will fluctuate. And in yoga, we know in, on, our, on this path of Kriya Yoga, the famous quote is, where motion ceases, God begins. The Bible says it, be still and know that I am God. So, yes, we're not in quarantine, but we are closed. We closed our guest facility. The community is trying to keep its distance. We're trying to follow the protocols. But on the other hand, so we've been asked to stay home. On the other hand, we have the tools to make this a worthwhile time to stay home, to take this time really to enter into harnessing the energies of the mind, learning to calm the mind, because the mind is how you build a very, very strong immune system. And what if we do get the virus? Doesn't mean that we failed mentally, because the other thing that we have to realize is that this whole world is in God's hands. It's, we try to control it and we make ourselves uh, sick mentally sick, if we try to always control, no, it's not the way I want it, it's not the way it should be. It, it is adverse to spiritual teaching. Yes, we use our will, and yes, we will act and reason, yes. But all of those things we can control, you just, we just need to let it go and let it happen. It's part of God's drama. I was thinking the other day, how many possible lives have I lived through the dips and valleys of eternity? How many different bodies possibly, or how many different experiences have I lived with the idea that I need to control it, or I, uh, or it isn't the way? When Jesus said, he who overcomes I will make a pillar in the temple of my father, and he will go no more out. We're in a cyclic dream process, and we go out of spirit, and we come, go back in, we rest, we rejuvenate. Every near-death experience participant or, uh, or experience will tell you self-awareness continued, Self-awareness, I went through the tunnel, I went into the light. It isn't just this little 80-year experience. We have a whole awareness, a whole sense of self that has never died. It, will, it was never born, it will never die. So it's important for us to pick the world events up by the right knot. It's really important that we go into our center, because we don't want to keep going out, as Jesus said. He who overcomes, what does he overcome? He overcomes the delusion of mortality. And you can do it right here. I wanted to read this, this quote from uh, Sri Yukteswar because it really helps us put it in perspective. <clears throat> it is the Spirit of God that actively sustains every form and force in the universe. Yet, this Spirit of God is transcendental, transcendental and aloof in the blissful, uncreated void beyond the worlds of vibratory phenomenon. 
He further explains, saints who realize their divinity, even while in the body, know a similar twofold experience. What is that twofold experience? I am. And the I am actually exists behind the vibratory phenomenon of this world. Same as the Spirit of God. Sat Chidananda. Ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. The soul. Ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss individualized. It's the same. That's why we experience the twofold experience. Bliss. The whole universe is manifesting from a vibrationless phenomenon or behind vibration, the vibrational phenomenon. Bliss is the only term Master said that Yogananda said you can describe spirit. Bliss is the only term to describe ourselves. So we need to touch that. And we need to make this time in the world that can be so apprehension, apprehensive and anxious for many people, profit from this time. Go inside. And if it's imaginary first, it's OK. Sit in that tunnel and look at the light. Visualize it, imagine it if you need to first. Because that very act of imagination begins to help you to bring the energy of the nervous system in. Because when you succeed, everybody in this community laughs at me because this is one of my favorite quotes. When the mind is deeply calm, the inner light spontaneously appears. It takes concentration. It takes gaining control of the mind. The mind loves to spin. The thoughts aren't even ours. We perceive them and they go. They, we perceive them and they go. The only thing that is ours is this sense of I M. And once we realize that bliss behind vibrational phenomenon, we realize I am blissful existence itself. And that's it. Eternal self. That very concept or that very realization in itself brings bliss ever conscious. I'll never die. I, I was never born. I am bliss. So realize that in this time. That's the best consciousness, the best mental programming we can do to develop a very strong immune system that helps us, as Yogananda said, stand firm among the crash of breaking worlds. So I wish you in this time the best. God bless you all. And be strong, be healthy, be blissful.
Lord.